Good afternoon and welcome to the 55th New York Film Festival and to the HBO Director's Dialogue with Agnes Varda and JR. Um, Thank you. We came too early, right? What? We came on the stage too early. No, you came on the stage just right. <laughs> you do the blocking, not me. <laughs> hello, everybody. Hello, hello. So, I just want to ask a few questions, uh, and we're going to keep this really informal. Uh, but, Agnes, have you ever collaborated on a film fully before this film? Not yet. <laughs> Not yet, okay. JR is my first partner okay. in, in making a film. And what made you decide you wanted to do that? Well, I didn't decide. It came in a very strange way, naturally, if I may say so. We met once because somebody said we should meet. And he came to my place, and the day after. The day after, we, st we you came to my place the day after, actually. And, and then the third day, the third we, day we started walking. So we decided to, to do something together. The something was not very precise. Yeah, we didn't know it would be a film. So actually, we, uh, if someone had told us, both of us, we would you know, be making a film uh, like we had to walk two years on a film. I don't think we would have agreed. We didn't know each other. I don't know if Agnes was a nice lady that, you know, or she would beat me with the, like a stick of wood. I didn't know. So <laughs> the fact that we just decided to do a little project, we were like, oh, fine, it's just a little project. And then that little project became, you know, a couple of minutes. Then we were like, oh, maybe it's going to be a 20 minutes. Then we, we had in mind something that we have together. Oh, yeah. That we really have curious of people, we have empathy for people, yeah. and they interest us. And you have been doing images of people you met everywhere in the street. Uh, I've been doing, doing documentaries with unknown people, with gleaners, with fishermen, with squatters. And I see that you have done images of people on, on your neighborhood, that your friend Lodge. So we had in common to to like to work with real people. So, you know, that was a good base. Now, in the making of the film, we got to get to know each other, and, and still today. But it's normally, you know, you know someone, you have, you know, you know someone for a couple of years, or you met a few times. It didn't happen in that case. And we now it's funny that we can look at it two years later, but... Do uh, you think we know each other now? Oh, I'm starting to know you. And you know Agnes's cats as well. Yeah, which I'm allergic, by the way. But I, <laughs> you know, by love uh, for Agnes, I kind of, you know, accepted they would be in the film because anyway, there was no negotiation there, like on many other topics. So, <laughs> you see, that, uh, she's, you know, she's, she's open to negotiation to a certain extent. It's not a question of negotiation, but we have to agree on whatever we do. And so, when we thought we could, w the in this village, we said, okay, then. Then, in the village, we met people. And we started to think, this one could be fine. And we agree on that. We never discuss of the people that we got the same touching feeling with some people. So it did well. Um, one of the things that I've always admired in Agnes's films is that she gets people to tell their own stories, and those stories interest her. And that's particularly true in the series of documentaries, in, in, from the Gleaners to, to this film, but also in some of the short films. People like to talk to you. I mean, you draw them out, and their stories become the stories of your films. And um, I'm, I'm very interested in and JR, you can see from the film, those of you who've seen it, how engaging he is 
with people he doesn't know at all and how he gets them to stand there for the camera and have their portraits taken. And it seems to me that that's a talent you share, but not in exactly the same way. Well, also it's a difference of experience. And size, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> for the one who noticed, uh, you know. Should I say once and not come back to that? He has complained, two complaints about me. I'm too small, I'm too old. <laughs> no, that's it. All right, we've covered this. <laughs> After that fact, we didn't discuss it any longer. That's true. So it is true that I have been, you know, I did a documentary in my suite in 75, just my neighbors, the shopkeepers around me. And I was impressed that maybe I have that face, even when I was younger. People agree to speak to me. Uh, they feel confident uh, because I'm not, but, but I would think I'm tough. I'm <laughs> not tough with people I meet. I'm just like a, a normal neighbor attitude. And so, peop oh, I lower them. Oh, I'm not pushing so much question, but I think that should be conversation and not question answer. So conversation means that they say something, sometimes I speak about myself, or I speak about my kids or about something, so that there is kind of going for back and forth words. And then it becomes that I keep what they say. I'm not interested to repeating my own stories. But it makes them feel that we could speak, and then they feel confident. And in the film Daguerreotype in my street, I remember at some point, asking them what they dream of. And I found out that we think that dream means something, what you dream. but most of the people who know nothing, they think that dream is losing time. So they say, I don't dream, I have no time. The other ones say, no, this is like, oh, we lose time. It was so interested that they, they, they said that dream was maybe not speaking, not sleeping. So I learned by people what they understand which helped me to understand what I don't understand. Um, that film that Agnes is talking about is called uh, Daguerreotypes. In the, that's the English translation. And it's one of my favorite films of hers. And it's shot on her street, uh, the Rue de Guerre, named for the photographer. And then 10 years later, or 15 years later, she made a, a, a follow-up short film about what happened to that street and what happened to the people there and which shops changed hands and are no longer there. And they're both together on the DVD. In other words, if you get by. The same way when I did The Gleaners and I, this I did two years later, it's called Two Years Later, I went back to see the people. It was, it's a documentary problem, you know. We go, we meet people, they give themselves to the film, they speak, then we go to festival and people say, it's wonderful. And with what is wonderful is the people in the screen. And then we are, you know, we are invited in good hotels and they are still at home, still sometime in the street. So I thought for two years later I had to go back to these gleaners, try to find them again, giving them my, my empathy because I could not steal their life and then just s escape. So that's why documentary raises a problem, including the film we did together, you know. Do we keep connection with the people we film? We try, because it cannot be just model and then go home. So we kept, we keep seeing the docker workers. We keep seeing the the old lady from the north. Yeah, uh, but you know, in in um, that's also why we 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 got along and we wanted to enlarge the people's faces. Because uh, I don't come from documentary. I've only done one, but in my artworks, that's. The fact that I come back to the place is the base of it. So I don't go and take photos and never come back. The, fa the photos are made to be back to the community. They're not made to be anywhere else. So um, when I take any photo somewhere else, I go back to paste it in the place of the people or uh, that's how I've always started my project. So I never had that feeling because of the fact that I build projects with communities. And then I started a project where I don't even come and I let the people build their own projects and I send them the prints so that they really decide if they want to be empowered by the art or how and what message they have behind it. And it's interesting because 
um, that question comes, of course, when you know you're a filmmaker and you document, and and um, that was the first time that I was doing it that way, and that's why I felt the balance by also creating project with the people in each place, and at the same time uh, working with Agnes on on telling a story that uh, you know started with our curiosity to go in small villages and continued into what are we seeing you know i wanted to know what she sees through her eyes and 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 she wanted to understand also what was behind my glasses and so we we got to get to know each other through that little line that actually um took us quite a long way don't speak about our eyes because you hide your eyes and i have my eyes not too good so we're a pair of <laughs> bad eyes sorry <laughs> but whatever we see enough for what we wanted to do and we see well because you know you need the mind to look, you need the heart. Looking at people is not only an eye problem, I believe so. You know, when I first saw this film, I must have known that it was that you had a camera and you had a camera, but there were many more cameras who were shooting what you did. And the editing in this film is so fluid that you forget that totally. I mean, I forget that behind your cameras, there was another camera and another camera. And one of the things that's remarkable about the film is that the, just as in Man with a Movie Camera, the cameraman, the camera woman is being photographed yeah. by an invisible camera. And it all comes together in the editing. The editing oh, is remarkable. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a question. Are we speaking to people who have seen faces, places? No, no. And I how many not, people are I going to see it tonight? For compliments. It's just because. And these people are going to see it tonight. No, it's we because. Cannot reveal. Half and half. So you can't reveal the ending, so no. Some of our words. Nobody die at the end, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> We're only here. It's. No, I'm saying. And also, you you know, there's something we can't say before you see the film. There's no special effect. There's no uh, what? Uh, there's no um, uh, a, a suitcase. You know, in every in every mo movie, there's like a, a weird suitcase, or there's no <laughs> gun, or there's no what else? Uh, a monster, or like just so you know, it's it's a no special effect. Yeah, and so just to warn you that it's um, it's it's pretty simple. Yeah, but the story twists <laughs> and turns in ways that you don't... It, but the story goes down roads you wouldn't expect it to go down. I'm saying, is it daring today to do no special effect, no violence, no suspense? I mean, that's, it became daring to do so because, you know, the world is so violent, so disgusting in a way that it's easy to pick in the life, in real life, some subject, hurting subject, violent, whatever. And we try to escape, even politics, we never ask the people what were they were voting for, never. So we don't know, we di we're not interested. We were interested to person to person. That, that's true, but one of the things that makes this film so uh, moving is there is a great sense that there still is a working class in France and that there is something like working class solidarity still, which is pretty much vanishing here. Uh, and these people may not vote for the same party, but they do have a sense of pride in being workers and almost all the people that you talk to are workers with working class pride. Yeah, you know, we, we didn't like uh, scout for working class uh, people, but that's uh, who we met on the way in factories or in the docks of Le Havre. Uh, for us, we we never see classes; we see people, and then they take and us and into their and having no power. People having yeah, no power exactly. in the society. Yeah, we always make sure you know we don't you know we don't uh, interview the mayor or you know people uh, uh, from any uh, yeah the chief or whatever. So we just go for regular people. The mailman ma must be the most important person we interviewed, uh, which is actually a very important person. And <laughs> because uh, the uh, the relation he has with everybody in, in his uh, community and the fact that uh, um, we blow him up like super big on a building, the yeah, truth the is... in It's three 
See, three etages. Yes, three, three floors high, which converted to Agnès' size, it's like 10 floor building. <laughs> and uh, that's why, she, you know, she it's always it's told me that it's no. so he big. That measure, you know, like <laughs> some people have the measure. He yeah. has my, my yeah. size. Agnès is one meter, like three feet, so like you multiply that and you get the... That's how we measured everything in the film. But the, f the thing is, <laughs> he was... Everybody know him in the village already, so... The thing is, we didn't make him famous. Right. It's interesting that, you know, um, uh, no one was looking to be famous in this. It was more playful. It was more like, how do you look again at your mailman when, when this, um, he's, he's explaining in the film that his work is disappearing in a certain way that, you know, there's less and less mail and people used to invite him and he used to go home with tons of melon and, and fruits and stuff from the people and there's, you know, communication. And that's just a tiny example to, to show how much we're disconnecting ourselves from each other. And, and in the film, what we're trying to do through those giant pasting is actually to reconnect people in a physical way because everything has to be done in a very, you know, uh, old school way. Like we take glue and paper and we paste it on wall and people come and help and, and bring a chair or a ladder so we can paste it higher. And it's, it's very uh, basic, but it reconnects people. And what they remember after is not how great was the photo, but the fact that they had to speak with their neighbor, they had to meet new people they didn't know. And that's what encouraged us to go further and further and also show it in other villages what we've done. And the funny thing is when we went back in all those cities to show the film, they, you know, then they saw the whole trip because each of them have only seen their little part in there. And, um, and you know, uh, and yes, at the edit, uh, d which she do in an incredible ways. She w she wrote it at the edit also. You know, we we had many ideas and stuff, but then the edit is something that she took the credit for because it's really a, a gymnastic of of words and imagine that that she mastered. And I was really impressed because often sometimes we shot something and we had amazing moments, but I couldn't even see how we would use that. And uh, the f you know spoke about fluidity. And that's what I work for, because it cannot be a list of sketches. It has to be like something mysterious that brings us from one thing to another, like sometimes side ideas or some images of some sound. But we wanted you to be with us, just going from one place to another, not not a list, you know, but but a tra uh, traveler, you know, a promenade, uh, something. But when we, you speak about the mailman that I love, but you see, we, ha we met these workers in a factory, in a chimic, chimic. Chemical, chemical factory. Chemical factory. Oh, it's a tough life, you know, it's a tough life of workers. And we thought, can we make a collective portrait of them? And they like the idea and we say, let's meet in the morning because they work, you know, some people start at eight, some people start at one, some work at night. So we had to do two tours, and let's come and make a collective image. And s they sort of enjoy. He said, let's do this. We asked him, let's do that. I said, put your hand. He said, can you put your hand? And I was impressed that they, they, played, they played with us. Nobody said, it's ridiculous. Let us, you know, let's just tell them that. Like. So he said, let's do it better than a school image, where they all sit like this, you know, when they do the class. He said, can you? send your arms like this and then we say oh it's lovely because they seem to meet one group to the other group they seem that they want to reach each other so the idea of link was our big big idea link between the people link with us link with the audience so that it's like can we share the pleasure of meeting people can we share their life and we are the go between so their life come to you and we try to say that we didn't make it just charming and lovely, like some newspapers started to say. It gets on my nerves, you know. It's not an exquisite film. It's a documentary. And that because we got along and he puts me down, and that's, it's our little number, you know, we do to each other. Because it makes the film lighter. But the subject is not so light. It's can we meet the people, can we get something of them which is unique, important, and then he makes it big with images, and we together make them speak, express themselves, say something that 
We haven't heard. We learned about this pe- from these people. We learn about what it is to be the last day of working in the factory. We learn about the old lady that she's supposed to get rid of the house. She's the last one in the street. So it's unique moments, you know, because after the film, she had to leave. So, you know, we come capture something. Did she have to leave, that yes. woman? She's gone. Yes. Oh. So just yeah. to say that we had the feeling it was precious to film that at that moment because it wouldn't last. And even the thing with the tide, it's a mythical image, you know, the tide comes and erases everything, but we kept it in the film. So it's, we had the feeling that we try and capture time because time is going all the time away. And so is my life, so is everything in the time. But we try to grab something that we could thank to Jay, who is fast, he's even faster. I don't know why he goes the steps faster than me, but he does. <laughs> Um, but you know, J.R. isn't the only photographer in the film. I mean, the things in the film, some of them that are so moving to me, is the scene on the beach about Guy Baudin, uh, your childhood friend, when you do the whole blow up of the photograph that you took of him on the beach, one of your first photographs in your show. And, uh, Guy Baudin was uh, well, he's well known with Guy Bourdin, and he passed away. But when I took this picture, he was very young, totally unknown. So was I. And and it was interesting that we, when Jaya looked, what he could put on that rock that he liked so much, that b- b- st- what's it it bunker. Was a bunker. There's a, there's a bunker that had fallen. You know, that had fallen from the cliff, uh, a bunker from the Second World War that the German built. And when the cliff uh, slowly, you know, uh, uh, reducing every year, at some point the bunker, which is a huge block, fell, boom, and uh, like fell exactly on an angle on the beach and stand like that. And it's still like this today. But you were very inspired by that rock. Yes. uh, I wanted to do something there for years. Now, I I, I, I was doing, you know, a lot of uh, motorbike in this uh, region, which is not well known. And I kept telling Agnes, I would love to take you there. And she was like, I don't care about your Normandy and your bunker. And so, you know, I, I, whatever. And then one day I was there again. And then she's like, where are you? And I'm like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm this, that, no, in that Normandy. And I, I would still love to take you here. And she's like, but wait, tell me the name of the city. And Normandy is pretty big. And I give her the name of a city close by that's kind of more known. And she said, wait. Set. Saint Aubin, and then I, I and I say, well, I know that very well, and that's next to Anglescoville, which is a tinier, even little village of one street. And she told me, I've been there in 1938 when I was seven. Then I've been there in 1954, oh, yeah, 54, with with yeah. Guy Bourdin. And then she also done one of our most famous photographs uh, uh, from Ulysse and a documentary uh, also that followed up on that. So there was all this material. So I took her back there. And then Can you believe that by chance, the same place that he wanted me to come, I had known it, and I took a picture there. I, I think it was miraculous because then, yeah. and then he would put on the rock something I did years before. It became consistent. It became something dealing with our lives, his life and mine, which was, we felt it was okay. We, we, knew, we knew there was a lot of place that we had in common but with a d- different timing. So, for example, you know, when we met, we were amazed that, you know, we both went and worked in China or in Cuba. Uh, uh, it's just that she was there when Fidel just took the island. I was there just five years ago. Uh, you know, that's the only, like, <laughs> timing difference that we, we had. But um, w- there was a lot of coincidence in a lot of the places we chose because, you know, there was a connection there. And the one... But Guy Bourdin was amazing because I actually knew about his work. Uh, but Agnès took me in a whole other, you know, journey into that that moment that they had there, um, those photos that they have done, and this homage that we wanted to do with him. Guy Bourdin, but yeah. you did you do something very important for me because I gave you a photo. He was sitting like this, very straight, and then when you saw the rock, you just turned the photo like this. And suddenly, he was like in a, comment on dit, un berceau. Um, 
are going yeah. up, yeah. And suddenly, the souvenir, the memory of Gibo there became like a child that that was rocking. I felt so touched that the image I had done, you change it into something which has another meaning, more, more uh, tenderness, more something. I felt so grateful that we worked together, but you added something, maybe it's called talent, but, <laughs> but it ended up that by the way you post, comment uh, uh, pasted that image, then we could go back and see the big rock, like a, like a big, well, that it could rest in peace forever. And then the tide came and up it went. Mm -hmm. So it was a lot of emotion that we went through for different, for different reasons, but ended up with the same reason to do that kind of piece of art that we believe a lot of where the people had ladders, it was very dangerous, the tide was coming, and then it became so peaceful and disappeared. I love very much what happened in this film. Me too. I think maybe we need to take some questions from these people. Oh, one thing first. I wanted to mention JR. I think people have seen this remarkable blow-up photo of the one-year-old child uh, on the wall. And he's Mexican, and he's looking over at the US from the Mexican side. That is a remarkable image. Thank you. Yeah. So this, this is that guy. Um, Questions out here, comments? Yeah. Okay, uh, yeah. I'll repeat. Uh, Anya, how does she feel the documentary, or does she feel the documentary offers her greater creative freedom or a different kind of creative freedom than fiction? I felt the same freedom in fiction when I did, you know, what you call vagabond, which is without root, without law. I felt that I had to just follow the energy, the despair, the revolt of that girl, and I filmed totally free. And I did other film with fiction totally free. But the thing is, I really love documentaries because I learn more by listening, by discovering people, discovering people. I think I do better something using images and sound for sharing knowledge or sharing encounters. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so she wants me to cover up when she. So, um, uh, and me, I've done only one documentary before that. So, for me, documentaries were only and is only a way to capture the moments that are happening around those ephemeral installations. Because uh, for me, the. Um, you know, when you see the image, that's just the, the, the final piece, but the process is the artwork to me, not the final image. So the process of people uh, uh, gathering, making the artworks, uh, the, the, the community around it, and then the reactions of the people, do, that's for me the most interesting. And I always documented it, mo mo mainly to do films for museum installation uh, so that people can see how the, you know, when I did the work in Israel, Palestine, how they re uh, reacted on each side. It's much more interesting than just looking at the photo. And, um, and so, oh, you know. Yes, yeah, for the bill. Okay, that should be good. It must be some live live feed that is. Yeah, so it's okay. <laughs> no, I think it's the other mic that now work, <laughs> which we're happy to know. <laughs> okay. What did, we, what did we learn from each other across generations? Apparently, we have a few difference, and people have noticed. So we did have to talk notice, about that. Did you notice we have 55 <laughs> years difference? <laughs> No, I learned from you a beautiful energy. In when you meet the people and you do these big images, it's like right away making people be bigger than life. And I like the project that you had inside, inside Out, in which your idea of having people taking pictures and pasting them, you gave the idea. I mean, it happens everywhere in the world. You don't sign the idea. You, d you didn't make it like a copyright, whatever. I mean, they gave the idea to people that do it. You, you throw an idea that can be used by people for free. And I like so much free things, you know. Images in the street are, 
I'm not excited because I have street art now. I'm getting tired of it. I made a film in 1980 about street art in Los Angeles. And now it's come in, in more and more and more. Now the street art is in museum, you know, okay. But <laughs> at the beginning, it was free. It was offering the people free art out of galleries, giving, giving their possibility to enjoy without having to pay. And we we love when people don't have to pay. When we took his magical truck that I love so much, and we arrived in a village, and we could say to the people, you can come and take a picture. You will have the enlargement, the poster. You can take it home. You can keep it with us. You can paste it with the other. No money to be spent. No advertising. Not, nothing like this big show they go, you know, like big commercial show they go for TV and they have a lot of sponsor. Nothing. You come, you come if you wish. You take it if you wish. And, and in some places like the abandoned village, we did a picnic. We say, come, enjoy the day. They had nothing to pay. They enjoy. We saw that we could sharing just a day with people we never knew before. And we had a, we had a ball that day. I, I think they did also. And, uh, and on my side, you know, um, I, there's, I was just realizing that today when w I was doing an interview earlier and the journalist wanted us separately. And, uh, and so I did, because we don't do much things separately. You know, <laughs> it's, it's funny. We actually, um, in France, we wouldn't do one interview not being together. And then we just, we accepted because one needed to change uh, b while the other was changing. So we're like, okay, we'll do that. But I think because it's exactly a little more than two years that we know each other. And in the meantime, we've done that film that, you know, I started not that long ago pinching myself and starting thinking, wait, am I learning? I'm, I know I'm learning every day, but am I really realizing everything I'm learning? Because it's not like I had the chance to spend two hours with her and I'm going to try to grab as much information from those two hours. I spent two and a half years and I hope many more to come. So um, <laughs> every, you know, uh, yeah, she's tired of me already, but I'm, you know, I know her address. I have a phone number <laughs> and a FaceTime. So I'm not, li you know, and your Instagram also. So, you know, be ready. He told me to do Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> so I started to do it, but I don't do it every day. I do it like once a week when he posts. Things, you but know, I, I film her day. every day, so you'll see her on my if, if she don't put. But anyway, what I'm learning is that um, you know her constant curiosity, and and she's curious about everything always, and like like a kid, you know, and that's something that um, I think it's it's is a is a magical key to stay aware of the world. She don't just you know say hello, what do you do? She say why you do it and how and constantly with everything with everybody and oh, you look like i'm questioning people all the time no no no. i think she's cia but you know she's <laughs> she would m make a great agent like an amazing agent they feel it they feel i wish to know i don't have even have compliments i give you you have to like correct me can you believe that can i speak freely we're in america it's a free country we can't speak freely and yes i told you there's certain country where you, you can have that right on me but here i'm i'm you know, people will notice if they show <laughs> that you're directing me. In French, we say, tu exagères. <laughs> yes. Yes. Merci pour votre collaboration. Le film est magnifique. Vous deux faites toujours des, uh, des projets très originaux et si émouvants. Uh, Qu'est-ce que sont vos conseils pour des jeunes cinéastes et des artistes? What are our advice for young uh, filmmaker and artist? Uh, I let you speak, as you know, I'm, I'm still, I, I want that advice too, actually. So. <laughs> I never give advices, I never. Because what I say is that believe in what you like, filmmakers you like, books you have read, painting you have seen, films that you love, they should feed you, they should give you the desire to express yourself. And you will find in your own deep, deep down, in your own desire of imagination, you will find it. I cannot tell you, do this, do that, because, okay, if you have it now, everybody has little camera, little, even on the telephone you can. So it's not a question of tool. Find in yourself, if there is some emergency, some desire, something that pushes you to do, 
and then do it. But there is no advice, you know. This is not something, I don't even believe so much in school because I never went to any school of cinema. I didn't even well, learn anything. I, I went, I listened to teacher in the Sorbonne, to philosopher, to painters. I listened, I tried to do my own uh, background of knowledge, but I believe that everybody, if there is imagination, it has to have to have the emergency to do it. Don't do it to say, I want to be a filmmaker, and so what? Everybody can be a filmmaker. At what point it makes to you be the one who does to do that project? It has to be yours, really. Is that an advice? I don't know. <laughs> she, wh I heard you say today, Agnes, that when you, before you did your first film, uh, you, you've only saw five movies in your life. She said ten to me. <laughs> uh, yeah, why? So it's changing to depending <laughs> of who she talks to. Depends of the day, of my, <laughs> of my memory. But what I know is I meet young people, students who come, and some, comment dit les stagiaires? Interns. Uh, yeah, they come to us, and they are 22, 23. They have seen hundreds of films. They know everything. I'm so impressed. Mm. They know, you can speak about Cassavet, you can speak about Hitchcock, you can speak about, you know, Godard or... Doyon, they know everything. I'm, I'm, I admire that. I must say, I knew nothing. And maybe if I've known five masterpieces, I would not have dared starting, maybe. I started because I was stupid and innocent. So I threw myself in cinema. And then after, I started to think about other films. And Alain René, who did the editing of my first film in 54, 55, he said, you have to go to the cinematic and say, where is that? And he gave me the address. I said, what should I see? First thing he sent me to see, see, you should see Vampire of Dreyer. So the first thing I saw at the cinematic. Then he made me a list. I started, to, and now I love to see film, but we're speaking about 60 years ago, 70 years. So I didn't come from cinema. I came from loving painting, trying to understand what it meant. Ancient painting, nowadays, at the time, nowadays painting, reading a lot. I learned a lot. You know, like, I would say, I learned editing from Dos Passos. I learned writing from Faulkner, the structure of his writing. I learned poetry from Prévert. I learned, because learn, I mean, I appreciate that. I, I made it my, my nourishment, can you say that? Uh, I, I the, your, your soul, your I no, made it no. knowledge. What, can she ate, what she kept eating, yeah. No, eating your diet. Huh? <laughs> your diet. <laughs> yeah. You had a diet. <laughs> and I thought, and then life. Yeah. Everyday life is a beauty. Whatever happens, you can sit in a cafe, just look at people. That's an advice I would say. Just stay put and look. Look what's happening. Sometimes the natural mise en scène of what's happening in front of you. Like if you had a frame, don't move from that frame <coughs> and see what comes in and out. Sometimes, I remember being teaching f for a week at Calas, which is an university at uh, Los Angeles. And I took the, the student with 16 meter camera, three of them. We went in a very big restaurant cafe downtown. And I said, place your camera. So the one was there, they decide, I say, make your frame. And I say, no, we have no stock. You don't have to film. Just look through the frame. Stay there one hour. Look what comes in, what comes out. T would you like to film that moment? Or maybe you would like to change the lens, or maybe not. Don't move. Just learn to see what comes into the frame. And they were shocked. You say, we would like to film. I say, no, you don't need to film. You need to look at, like a cameraman, like a filmmaker. And they were surprised because they came home at the Calat thing, they say, I think we learn a lot because we discover so much that life does a mise en scène, come on, the mise en scène. Mm -hmm. yeah. the, sometimes the, they come in the frame, they stay, they move. I remember taking a picture and say, how beautiful the people put themselves in the frame. Uh, it's the, what Cartier-Bresson loved, the 
comment ils appellent le l'instant fugitif yeah the the fugitive instant the decisive moment yeah in english yeah le moment décisif but you see one moment there is one moment <laughs> but totally the photo is interesting and it was not before it was not after in filming it's the same uh we have to learn to observe to to be attentive to the movement happening you know we can go in a normal city in a harbor even near the ocean i'm so excited about the ocean just look at the waves the little waves the movement of life the movement of, of the shadow when a shadow comes and then goes i'm very excited about that it makes my day sometimes just to see a landscape and the shadow passes and then again light comes i think it's a, it's a gift it's a treat so i may be innocent about that but i enjoy things that filmmaker should enjoy maybe we have time for two more um here on the aisle Oh, okay. Um, when filming people, do you think they're more interesting with their eyes open or their eyes closed? To do what? <laughs> with closed eyes, you mean? With eyes closed or open, which is more interesting ah, daring. on film? It's daring. Close my eyes, you mean, and film? No. When you film les gens, tu préfères qu'ils aient les yeux ouverts ou fermés? Well, I never dared filming a dead person. <laughs> but I wanted. I never dared because it's this is so intolerable. What is it? Intolerable that they cannot open their eyes. So it becomes interesting to film that as a fact, but you can ask somebody to close their eyes and film that. I don't know why. Depends of the moment, the time, the day, the person and what about you for filming? What do you like? No, I, on building, I actually pasted a few people with eyes closed, but it's uh, uh, often, you know, s the the power of the eyes is often, s you know, so much stronger that I I haven't done it th that many times. And sometimes in places, uh, in especially I'm seeing in China where they were destroying and ev uh, evicting people, just having eye closed in the middle of those ruins, uh, you know, would say so much more. So um, I've done it a, f a few times and. Um, and yeah, it's. And you paste it, beautiful eyes on train, on walls, on many places. And your and eyes too. Yes, but I must say, I'm the only one. You paste it, my. Comment on dit mes orteils? Ah, yeah, your foot. Your, my, f your my toes. Little, my yeah. foot toes. Yeah. Um, I can say, you paste it, eyes of many people. But I'm the only one. You paste my toes. <laughs> <laughs> That's on true. We'll train. make a little chain with you that even saying send on it the for train. you. You send me to travel on a train with my feet. <laughs> yes. Wha what did we learn from each other on this film and what message you want to give to the audience? Well, I think that was kind of answered. Yeah? Do you want to elaborate? But I think you've answered that. And also, it's hard to say what message uh, we wanted to pass in that film because it's a journey. I think there's many. There's many we don't even understand ourselves. There's some that we try to, you know, of course, to take you in a certain direction. But at the end, everyone will see this film depending on their own story, their own relation with, uh, you know, s uh, someone's close to them. Me, it was to my grandmothers. And, uh, and I mean, th that's why it's, I'm actually more curious of what people, how people would, you know, what, what people would take from that film than what we actually took from it. But we received a lot of, of feedback, a lot of answer from the audience so far. And we were very touched that we had done the film with a lot of heart. But it comes back that people so far has re have received the film with emotion. They laugh. They, they have sometimes a little emotion. Sometimes they enjoy our number of duo. And sometimes they think it's vaguely ridiculous. But we still go on bringing people as a link to you. I mean, I think that's what we wanted to do. So far, the, the feedback is wonderful for us. It's, it's a reward, you know, I would say. No? Oui. OK, one more in the back with a very high hand. Yeah. 
either wait for the mic or speak very loud. Je visite beaucoup de petits villages et ça m'a beaucoup touché. Je l'ai vu deux fois et j'ai pleuré, j'ai ri, je l'ai adoré. Et je vous remercie beaucoup. <laughs> Merci. Yes. And you know, I think you're right. If I may dare to say, if you like the film, see it a second time. But she saw it twice. Yes, I know, that's why I say the second time is better. Okay, thank you. I'm hoping I'll get to see your film tonight because uh, it's not free and it's sold out. But Hi. I'm wondering, I look at the two of you, and clearly you're lovers. <laughs> when, when can we expect you to make babies so we can have the next generation of film? Yeah, he said. Somebody asked me if I'd fall in love with him one day. I said no, because it's something very precious is a very strong friendship uh, oriented to work together. It was friendship it's, at first sight. But <laughs> yes, yes, but the, the working together is a kind of very lovely feeling and I love it. And he has his life, I have mine, whatever it is. But what we do together is really including love for working, but it has nothing to do with uh, Comment elle s'appelait ce film euh, où il y avait une vieille dame avec un petit garçon <laughs> The famous film. More than whatever. Yeah. It's not that. <laughs> <laughs> And he's not a little boy. He's a grown-up artist. And that's what I like. He kept some, some youth in him yet, still. <laughs> But also I kept some youth in me. For some reason. Oh, yeah. You know, wh whenever I see, like, often I, I in Paris, I do, uh, you know, uh, electric skateboard. And when you do that for a while, you need to recharge it. So at, like, 11 o'clock or midnight, I just knock at Anya's door. And then I say, I'm sorry, I know you're the only friend I, uh, that I have a plug that live on the ground floor. Uh, <laughs> and so she's like, yeah, sure, come in. And I say, oh, by the way, I have three more friends coming. I say, yeah, sure, bring them over. And then <laughs> at midnight, we, ha we, you know, we're in her little garden talking about things. And, and then he goes back with his... And then when it's plugged after one it? hour, we go back. What it's, is it? It's, 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 it's a snowboard. It's a skateboard, but with the, you know, you know he electric. Play, he plays in the street. They, we d none of us feel an age difference. We talk and, and uh, you know... Uh, It's, it's amazing. I'll never forget those conversations. And same when Agnes come and hang at my studio. And um, actually, the, the, the second day we met, when she came at my studio for the first time, there was a friend of mine uh, uh, named Mosdef, who's a, a, a rapper from here, and who, you know, uh, speak very loud and have all these things and theories and stuff. And so I was like, oh, maybe those two's not going to match. And actually, the match between them was amazing. And, and, and then I looked at Agnes that I just met the night before and I was like, wow, she's incredible because, you know, she's there talking to him about, you know, stuff she's done about the Black Panthers and this and that and what she sings about him. And, and also she don't know, she have, she have no clue what's his music, but it doesn't matter. And, uh, <laughs> and it was amazing, that relation. So uh, we don't really feel the age difference. And uh, um, when it comes to skateboard, maybe, but, you know, she's not interested in it anyway. <laughs> Thank you both thank very you. much. And thank you to HBO for the sponsorship of this free event. In case I didn't say that at the beginning. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Amy. I know you for so many years. <laughs> We spoke cinema for years. And you're still faithful that the cinema you love, I understand. And you understand the cinema I love. Thank you. Thank you.